Okay. Hello, everybody. I am. All right, hello everybody. Sorry about the technical difficulties. We're gonna get things going here in just one second. Okay. Make sure we can All right. Let's go ahead and go through a few announcements, a couple of things to get us on task. Sorry about the technical difficulties this morning. Um, I want to just remind everybody, those that might be visiting online even, uh, but also to our members, and uh, that, that our mission is still our mission at Hope of Israel, which is to develop Messianic disciples who serve as witnesses of Messiah Yeshua to Israel and the nation, so uh, to make disciples. And so this is why we're doing everything we can to utilize this time. Uh, we want to stay current during this uh, kind of fluid time where we're not sure when uh, things are going to get back to normal, whatever that may look like at the end. I want to encourage you to go to our website. It's uh, shalomronoak.com. And at the top, you'll see this little contact us uh, button there. And uh, it says prayer as well. You can fill that out just so we can keep you in the loop, uh, being able to send you emails and remind you of when things are happening and how things are changing. Uh, and the same, in the same vein, we've got this is also an opportunity for you if you have prayer. Uh, you know, somebody that's struggling right now, I uh, participated with a prayer uh, a thon with a group of pastors in our area on Wednesday, and there were almost 200 people called during that two-hour period uh, for people that wanted prayer. They were concerned and things like that. You have friends, send them a link to the prayer uh, to be able to submit a prayer, and that way we can uh, pray for that. And these are kept confidential by our prayer team, uh, but we want you to know that it's important uh, for us to be able to we can lift you up. Uh, during these times. And uh, so um, I've offered a class I want you to be aware of. You can sign up. Um, if you look below on Facebook, there's a link for it. Uh, DIY Passover. If you want to learn how to hold Passover during a plague, um, have you had friends ask you to show them how to do a Seder? Um, or, and you're like, I have no clue. And they say, but you've done it before. Uh, send them to this class. All they have to do is register on there and I'm gonna offer two different times. I'm gonna send those out hopefully tomorrow morning uh, for a couple of these classes. So send it, we already had a bunch of people already RSVP. Uh, so uh, shoot, shoot, shoot the link over to your friends or if you're interested to just hop in uh, for a fun time. Uh, it, it is ironic, uh, the plague situation with Passover. So. Um, and just so you are aware, We've had this on the book for Holocaust Remembrance Day. Never forget. Uh, so hold the date. You know, if we're still having to do virtual services, we're going to do a virtual service. And just so we never forget, it's that important. Um, so mark your calendars uh, for that date. Uh, Yom HaShoah, a uh, very important day to remember uh, the Holocaust and uh, the lives that were lost. And... Um, I was uh, asked to remind all the women uh, that the Messianic Women's Retreat has not, has not been canceled um, as of yet. Uh, we're going to keep you up to date. Uh, so if you're interested and want to register, uh, you want to hop on to that uh, you know, as soon as possible. Uh, in just a second, I'm going to have uh, I'm gonna pop Paul back on and he's going to lead us into uh, some music um, and some prayer. 
a little liturgy, and then uh, Maynard will come in and, and give a, a message for us for today of encouragement, and then we'll close up with the ironic uh, benediction again, uh, which is our, our custom. So wherever you are in your own homes, <laughs> uh, give a Shabbat Shalom to your, your family at six feet away, um, because that's what we're told to do. Uh, but I say Shabbat Shalom to you, and, and we look forward to uh, seeing each other again uh, in, in person. And, um, and so I'm going to pop Paul back in here. And, uh, and so it's going to take me just a second here, guys. Sorry, I'm not as uh, good with these controls as... Uh, good morning to everybody, and Shabbat Shalom. It's a joy to enter into the presence of the Lord, even if it's in our own homes, uh, far away from one another. Uh, the Lord is uh, capable of meeting with us in uh, in a building or outside of a building. And so we're, we're glad that we can gather together in unity uh, in his name, even if it's in separate buildings and separate places. Um, so we're just going to go through this, uh, the traditional, uh, the same stuff we do every week when we're all gathering together. So if you are on the live stream and you've never been able to visit, um, most of what we do in the service this morning is going to be exactly the same as you would see if you did come to visit in the, uh, in the actual building. And so as usual with the, any of the white text is just read by me and any of the yellow text uh, is read by the, the whole congregation. Borhu et Adonai Hamboach. Baruch Adonai Hamboach Leolam Vaed. Bless the Lord, the Blessed One. Blessed is the Lord, the Blessed One, for all eternity. We recite the blessing over the reading of the Torah portion. It, sound, it sounds like this, or you can just say Amen at the end. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam Asher Bacharbanu Makul Haamin. Venatan lanu et torato, Baruchata Adonai noten ha Torah. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe. You have selected us from among all the peoples and have given us your Torah. Blessed are you, O Lord, giver of the Torah. And now we recite the Shema along with Jews across the world. Uh, this comes from the Torah from Deuteronomy. Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Baruch Shem Yevod Malchuto Leolam Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be his name, whose glorious kingdom is forever and ever. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your children. And you shall speak of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk on the way. And when you lie down and when you rise up and you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes and you shall write them upon the doorposts of your house and upon your gates. Amen. <laughs> Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me.
preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, forever. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they come for me. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Hallelujah. We thank you, Father, as we have your assurance, we know for sure that we will spend an eternity with you. We thank you, Father, for this time that we have on earth to represent you before all the nations. We thank you, Father, for leading us in the way that is right for giving us your Torah, your instructions, so that we would know how we should live. But we thank you most especially for Yeshua, our Messiah, who has saved us with his outstretched arm, who led, led us by example on the earth and sits before the throne. We thank you, Father, for your spirit, which has been sent to bring us comfort. We thank you, Father, that you are holy, and even as uh, Yochanan the Immerser said, when he saw Yeshua, behold the Lamb of God who will take away the sins of the world. We give you the praise and the glory and the honor, Father, because you have made a way for us to enter into your kingdom and enter into your presence through the sacrifice of the Lamb. We enter his gates with thanks. We enter his courts with praise. For our God is good, for our God is great. Forever in power he reigns. Forever his love remains. So faithful and true. From age to age. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. Worthy is the Lamb. Holy, holy, holy. Is the Lord Almighty worthy is the land? Is the land? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We enter his gates with thanks. We enter his courts with praise. For our God is good, for our God is great. Ever in power he reigns, forever his love remains. So faithful and true from age to age. Holy, holy, holy is 
the Lord Almighty. Worthy is the Lamb. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. song unto the Lord, the ruler of Zion. May the Lord has brought salvation down by the strength of his hand. The Lord has shown his righteousness to all the nations. He remembers his love and his faithfulness ever will stand. Shout for joy on the earth with jubilant music. Sing a song to the Lord with all of your mind. Sound the blast of the horn with trumpets and singing. For his zeal or desire will turn all the darkness to light. Let the sea and song resound with everything in it. Let the land and all the creatures there join together and pray. The rivers and the trees unite and clap in their hands. And every mountain and valley will see that his banner is raised. Shout for joy all the earth with jubilant music. Sing a song to the Lord with all of your mind. Sound the blast of the horn with trumpets and singing. For his zeal over Zion will turn all the darkness to light. Let the people sing to him, for surely he's coming. For his judgment will bring peace and truth to the children of men. And his power will his justice fall upon every nation. And all the people will bow down and call on his name once again. Shout for joy on the earth with jubilant music. Sing a song to the Lord with all of your might. Sound the blast of the horn with trumpets and singing. For his seal over Zion will turn all the darkness to light. Shout for joy on the earth with jubilant music. Sing a song to the Lord with all of your might. Sound the blast of the horn with trumpets and singing. 
for his zeal over Zion will turn all the darkness to light. For his zeal over Zion will turn all the darkness to light. For his zeal over Zion will turn all the darkness to light. Hallelujah. Amen. We thank you, Father. Thank you for your presence with us this morning. We thank you for your Holy Spirit, your Ruach HaKodesh, that gives us peace and comfort. And we thank you that your zeal for your people will bring all of our darkness into light. We praise your name. We thank you. Do as name. Amen. Thank you, Paul. Okay. We're going to trade. All right, good to be here today. And at this time, we'd like to ask the blessing over the children and their teachers. Uh, today, you are their teachers, as always. And uh, welcome to quarantine schooling or something like that. And uh, it's good to ask a blessing over the children and the teachers. And, and thank you for being here today. Let's just pray. Our Father and King, we thank you for the children you've given us. And lo, they are heritage from you. We ask that you will have your blessing upon them, that you would indeed turn all this darkness into light, the light of your glorious kingdom. We pray that you will give us strength, wisdom to teach our children, that they would walk in your ways all the time. We ask that you would work, work in our lives today, and draw us close to you. We pray in the name of Yeshua, the Messiah. Amen. Amen. Well, it's good to be here today. And uh, to have a message from the Word of God. And just because we're not here physically does not mean uh, there's nothing to learn. I'm, I'm thankful that the Lord has given us technology that we can uh, use for his glory and for his kingdom. Uh, this technology could not have been imagined uh, 2,700 years ago when Isaiah wrote the words that we're going to look at today. Our Torah portion took us to Leviticus. Isaiah, and also to Matthew. And our focus today is on Isaiah, is on Isaiah. As I mentioned, Isaiah was written approximately uh, 2,700 years ago in 700 BC. Can you imagine how old that is? How long ago that actually took place? But God raised up a man and prepared him and gave him a message for his people and also for us today. Isaiah, the name, means the Lord is salvation. The Lord is salvation. And what an appropriate name for a prophet who is going to go before the people and proclaim that the Lord is salvation. There are five main themes of the book of Isaiah. First, the glory and greatness of God. Second, the sin of all the people of the earth and the judgment against them. Number three, Israel being scattered and regathered. Number four, the first and second coming of the Messiah. And number five, the fifth theme is the great tribulation and the millennium. Now, there are two classifications of prophets as we look at in Scripture. We call them the major prophets and the minor prophets. Now, it's not how much money they made. It's not the prophet, P-R-O-F-I-T, for you grammarians out there. It has to do with the quantity of Scripture that they wrote. Uh, you look at Isaiah, and you scroll through the pages of Isaiah, and you'll find 66 chapters in Isaiah which also happen, happens to correspond to the number of books in the, in the total book of Scripture, the Bible. So Isaiah was a prolific prophet, and God used him to cover these great themes throughout his book, and he's given us some themes for today. Now, let me distinguish uh, between two words that are often confused. The, the word foretelling versus forthtelling. And sometimes people think, okay, Someone is a prophet, and we talk about the prophets here. We go through Isaiah, Jeremiah, 
we look at the other prophets, Habakkuk and Nahum and Jonah and Micah and all those other people, all the prophets. And their role to, uh, back in those days is different than the role is today. Back then, they did not have the completed scriptures. In fact, uh, they didn't have much of anything. Uh, everything had to be written by hand on a, on a piece of vellum, some other kind of material, and uh, very expensive, very laborious kind of process. So scripture was a rare thing back then. That's why they gathered and they, they met to, to, to hear the reading of scripture. And prophets back then would foretell the future. We see that in Isaiah. Uh, look at chapter 6. Behold, a, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son. Uh, that happened yet. And he was predicting the future. And sometimes there is a short-term fulfillment of these prophecies. And other times there is a long-term view that may happen you know, dozens, hundreds, even thousands of years later than the words of the prophet. And we see that throughout Scripture. So foretelling was something that the prophets of old did, predicting the future, telling of kings who would rise and fall. Today, we have the completed scriptures in our hands. And I'm thankful I have a hard copy today. So if the internet goes down, uh, everything falls apart, we still have a hard copy, and I encourage you to find those hard copies before you need them, okay? So our role today is forth telling. What's the difference? Today, we have the completed Word of God in our very hands, and we are commanded to take the Word to the world. We are commanded to read the Word of God, to digest it. We, we asked a blessing upon the, the reading of the Torah portion today, which we did not read the entire Torah portion in, in a responsive way, as we normally do. It's kind of hard. But as we read the Scripture, we have the completed Scriptures in our hand, and many of us have a translation of, of the Bible in our own language. Praise the Lord. We are to tell forth the scripture. We're to tell forth the promises and the blessings. And yes, even the curses that God proclaims in the scripture. So our role today is not one of foretelling, but one of forthtelling the scriptures as God has given us. And now I invite you, if you have a copy of your scriptures, to turn with me to Isaiah chapter 44. Isaiah chapter 44. And what we see as we look at the book of Isaiah is we've seen those major, those five major themes. And we come to Isaiah chapter 44. There are seven points that I'm going to give you today that deal with uh, this chapter specifically. We could have talked about many other topics, many other themes, but I want to talk about Isaiah chapter 44. And the first thing that we see is we see the blessing upon Israel. It says, but now listen, Jacob, my servant, Israel, and whom I've chosen. Thus says Adonai, who made you and formed you from the womb, who will help you? Do not fear, Jacob, my servant, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. For I will pour water on the thirsty ground, land, and streams on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit on your offering, offspring, and my descendant, my blessing upon your descendants. What is this blessing that God has promised? That he will pour water on the thirsty ground. It, this is talking about Israel here. Uh, it can be a metaphor, and it can be a literal fulfillment of this. And we look at Israel today, and land that was, that was dry, that was desert, is now some of the most productive land on the planet, in a, in a very physical, literal way. All four streams on the dry ground. And he also goes on to say, they will spring up among the grass like willows by flowing streams. This one will say, I am Adonai." That one will be called by the name Jacob. Another right off hand, Adonai, and I will take the name Israel. So God promises to pour out his spirit upon the offspring of Israel and his blessing upon your descendants. And God has done that. God, when he makes a promise, 
is faithful to keep his promises. Another word for a promise that we have used many times in our teaching is the word covenant. God gave great covenants to Israel, and he also has kept those covenants. We see that throughout history. God has not forsaken his people. God has not cast off his people. God keeps his promises. So God starts off with his blessing upon Israel that he has not forgotten them. He is going to bless them. He is going to pour out his water upon the dry ground, the, the streams, give his spirit, give a blessing upon his descendants. And then we come on to verse 6. And we see the true God of Israel. It says, Thus says Adonai, Israel's king, and his redeemer, Adonai Savaot, I'm the first and the last, and there is no God beside me. Who is like me? Let him proclaim and announce it. Let him arrange it in order for me as I establish the ancient nation. Let them declare to them what is coming in future events. Do not dread or be afraid. Have I not told you and declared it long ago? So you are, you are my witnesses. And there is, is there any God beside me? Is there any other rock? I know of none. God is compared and contrasted here to the other gods that are out there. And we're going to, we're going to talk about the, the, the polytheism, the other gods, as we come to this chapter. But he says it up front. I am Israel's God. I'm the first and the last. There's no other God beside me. He says it up front. He's the God of Israel. He is the one and only true God. Now, when Israel came out of, of Egypt, uh, they had been there, what, 400 plus years, and they were surrounded by polytheism. Now, polytheism is, for you children who are watching, is, is a, a two, two parts of the word, poly, meaning many, theism meaning God. They had many gods in Egypt. And they were surrounded by idol worship. They had a God for just about everything. And it could be a temptation to worship those other gods. What's interesting is, is as we look, as we have looked uh, back in January at the various plagues of Egypt, those plagues, as God brought them upon the land of Egypt, were basically crushing those gods that were important to Egypt. They had a god for the water. They had a god for frogs, a god of all these different things. And God came along and said, I am more powerful than any of these gods, these false gods, these idols that you have set up. I am more powerful than any of them. And I, he crushed them. And we come to Isaiah here in verse 9. Number three, we see the emptiness of idols. The emptiness of idols. It says, those who fashion idols are empty. Their precious things do not profit. The witnesses do not see or know, so they will put, be put to shame. Who fashions a god or, or casts an idol for no profit? Behold, all his friends will be ashamed, for the craftsmen are only human. Let them all assemble. Let them stand up. Let them dread. Let them be put to shame together. And then he gives an example in verse 12. The blacksmith takes a tool and works it over the coals and fashionings with hammers. And he's working it with his strong arm. Yet when he's hungry, his strength fails. When he drinks no water, he gets tired. A carpenter stretches out a line. He marks it with a pencil. He shapes it with planes. He marks it with a compass. He shapes it like a figure of a man. Like the beauty of a man, so that he may sit in a shrine. He chops down cedars for himself, or he takes a cypress or an oak. He lets it grow strong among the trees of the forest. And he goes on, and he describes the emptiness of idols. Whether it's a blacksmith fashioning something out of metal, and hammering it, and heating it up, and forming it into something. Say a golden calf, like Israel did, and Aaron did or fashioning out of wood, 
you know, he plants these trees, cuts down the trees, he, and then he makes it, he carves it using various planting tools. He puts it on a shelf. He said, yeah, uh, it, it's, a, it's a great God. I, I made it myself. <laughs> okay. Uh, it, it's the vanity, the emptiness of these idols. that They are man-made. That's the problem. Uh, how can we worship them? How can they do something for us if we ourselves made them? Then we see, number four, the worship of idols. Now, the word worship is a word that is a combination of things. It actually means worth-ship. It means something that is worth uh, bowing down to, something that is worth worshiping is where it actually, what it actually means. So verse 15, he says, then something, then there's something for a man to burn. So he takes one of them and warms himself. He also makes a fire to take bake bread and he makes a God and worships it. He makes an idol and bows before it. He burns half of it in the fire. With this half, he eats meat. He rose to roast and is satisfied. He also warms himself and says, ah, I'm warm, I have seen the fire. Yet with the rest, he makes a God, his carved image. He falls down before and worships. He even prays to it and says, deliver me, for you are my God. But yet, verse 18 says, they do not know or understand. <laughs> for he smeared over their eyes, they cannot see in their hearts, they cannot understand. These idols are vain. They are empty. They cannot help you. They cannot help us do anything. Now, now if I were to ask those who are watching today, uh, do you have any idols in your house that you worship? You would say, uh, no way. I, I don't have any golden calves on, on the, uh, the fireplace mantle. I don't have any idols on my desk sitting here uh, that I bow down to and, and pray to. But let me ask you a question. What is an idol? What is an idol? An idol is something that we place a high value on. It's something that we put in place of God, that we often substitute for God, that has a higher priority than God in our lives. An idol doesn't have to be made of, of, of steel or metal or wood. It can be virtually anything that we put in front of God that takes his place. And I want to give you four questions to help identify idols in your life. Four questions. And uh, these are questions. I'm, I'm not uh, pointing fingers here. I'm not going to give uh, specific examples here. I don't even know who's watching. But I want you to ask these, answer these questions and think about these questions. Number one, are you willing to compromise your beliefs for it? Are you willing to, to compromise your beliefs for this? If so, it might be an idol in your life. Question number two, will you get angry if you can't do it or don't get it? Will you get angry if you can't do it or you don't get this? If so, it might be an idol in your life. Question number three, do you value it over people? Do you value this over people? Now, having nice things is, is great. I like nice things as much as anybody else. However, if this thing or this sort of thing you're doing makes you uh, desire that more than people, it could be an idol in your life. And the fourth question, does it push you closer to God or pull you farther away? There are lots of things in our lives that are good and in the right place can be a blessing in our lives, many things. However, those things can, uh, we can get our eyes off the Lord and they can become, these things can become an idol in our lives. 
they can, certain things can draw us to God. Other things can push us away from God. So these are our four questions that you can ask about anything to see if it is an idol in your life. The fifth thing that we see is the promise to Israel. Look at verse 21 with me. And it says, remember these things, Jacob, and Israel, for you are my servant. I formed you, you are my servant. Israel, you will not be forgotten by me. You will not be forgotten by me. That is a promise of God to Israel. Think about that. You will not be forgotten. You know, sometimes, uh, I, to, my, to my chagrin, I forget people's names. Now, I know you never forget names. You, your memory is like, you know, amazing. You don't forget names. But once in a while, I forget somebody's name. And I feel very embarrassed about that. Because I work hard to remember names. But once in a while, I do forget somebody's name. And, and uh, what you have to do then is introduce them to somebody else. They'll repeat the name. Okay, that's that's insider trick here. Okay. But God says, I will not forget you. I will not forget you. You can bank on it. That is a promise from God. That's a, that's a comforting thought to know. We also see, number six, the forgiveness of Israel. Look at verse 22. I have blotted out your transgressions like a thick cloud and your sins like a mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. God says, I have blotted out your transgressions. God has forgiven their sins. And to all those who call upon him, he will forgive their sins. An amazing promise from God. Israel had many sins. This is why God sent the prophets to them to remind them, turn, repent from your, of your sins. Come back to God. I'm standing here waiting for you as a loving father. So God had many, Israel had many sins. Their sin was very bad. And in fact, one of the things that we need to be reminded of is if we pretend that the darkness isn't dark, it dampens the beauty of the light. Israel's sin was dark. Israel's sin was, was egregious in the nostrils of a holy God, yet so is ours. Uh, you know, let him who is without sin cast the first stone here. You know, our sin is egregious, is an offense to a holy God, just like Israel's sin was in, in their day. Now, let's, let's end with some, some good news here. I think this is uh, going to be my the best point here. In number seven, we see the redemption of Israel. What does the word redemption mean? It means, the redeem means to, to buy back. Israel belongs and belongs to God and belongs to God today. And the idea here is that Israel is going to be redeemed. Israel is, is going to come back at some point here. And look at verse 23. It says, Sing, O heavens, for Adonai has done it. Shout, depths of the earth, break forth into singing mountains, forest, and every tree in it. For Adonai has redeemed Jacob and will be glorified through Israel. Thus says Adonai, your Redeemer, who formed you from the womb. I am Adonai, maker of all things, stretching out the heavens alone, spreading the earth abroad by myself, causing the omens of boasters to fall, making fools of diviners, turning wise men backward and making their knowledge foolish, while confirming the word of his servants, fulfilling the counsel of his messengers, saying of Jerusalem, she will be lived in, and the cities of Judah, they will be built up, and I will raise up their ruins. We see that God had a plan for Israel, not only in the times of Isaiah. God has a plan for Israel today. God is not through with Israel. Even though Israel has turned her back on, on him uh, nationally, God is still working among his people in a great way. 
Uh, God has uh, drawn people unto himself. God is still in the business of redeeming Israel and all who call upon his name. Now, I want to share a verse with you that I think is, is critical. 2 Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. I saw this on a, on a Facebook wall this week, and I thought, you know what? Now, the professor, actual factual in me, wants to say this it, promise was written to, to Israel. And if you look at the context of this here, in fact, verse 13 says, preceding this, if I shut up heaven, that there be is no rain, or if I command the locust to devour the land, if I send pestilence or plague among my people, it says, if my people. You can also say, when my people. It's also another way of, of translating that. And I saw this on a Facebook post, and I thought, yeah, this is designed for Israel. And this was when Solomon had, was dedicating the temple, and God came to him in a vision. And God knew that the people were going to turn back, that they were going to sin. But yet, if they would acknowledge their sin, if they would repent, God would accept them once again. I read an article this week. And it says, Israel's chief rabbi calls for nationwide fasting, asking for God to remove the coronavirus. Israel's chief rabbi has called the nation to humble itself before God this week and fast amid the coronavirus outbreak that has brought the Jewish state to a grinding halt. Chief Rabbi David Law wrote in a letter Sunday urging all of Israel to fast until midnight on Wednesday to remove, remove the coronavirus disease from our midst. Difficult days, he says this, are affecting all of Israel and the entire world. At this time, it is on us to do some soul searching. Rabbi Law wants Israelis to examine their relationship to, with God and those around them. For those who are able to fast to the health reasons, he encouraged them to practice Ta'anit Debor, abstaining from any speech that does not revolve around the Torah or prayer. The chief rabbi's letter instructs municipal rabbis to hold prayers on Wednesday at synagogues throughout the country. Wow. Amazing. We had, many of you probably saw that Tony was involved this past Wednesday night with a group of pastors uh, praying. People were calling and bringing their prayer requests before this group of pastors and, and rabbis and leaders uh, here in Roanoke, the Roanoke area. And the, what's amazing to me is that God might use a virus, a plague, a, a pestilence to bring his people back to humble themselves and pray. But there's also some good news, even if you're not Jewish. Let me, let me say this. As we study the character of God his character, as we see even there in, in Second Chronicles, is to show mercy to, a, to thousands of generations. And can any of you think in Scripture where a, a pagan nation had received word that they're going to be destroyed, yet they repented, and God showed great mercy to them? Can you think of any nation? I see that hand, yes. <laughs> I think of Jonah, God's reluctant prophet, who God sent to the Assyrian capital of Nineveh. The Assyrians were, were pagan. They were, they, were, they were as bad as you get. They had stoned prophets. They had done all kinds of things. They, they were terrible. But yet, Jonah preached to them God's message. Forty days and, and you'll be destroyed. And what did the king from the greatest to the least of them do. They repented. They put on sackcloth and ashes and repented and turned from their sin. And what did God do? God heard them. And God, in his mercy, removed that judgment 
from that land and didn't destroy them with that destruction. So God, this promise here, yes, it's to Israel, but we can apply that to us today. We can apply this because if the character of God is to when people come to repent, God hears, God forgives. And it's not something that's new here. As we book in, read in the book of Yochanan or John, as we would call it today, we read that God so loved the world. And that world encompasses those who are Jewish, those who are not, everybody. And if you will repent, turn to God, he will hear you, he will forgive you, and he will heal you. He will heal your soul. And we can experience that as people come to the Lord, we can experience revival in this land uh, if we turn to him. Let us pray. Our Father and King, thank you that you are Lord over all the earth. That you reign and you direct the affairs of mankind. Thank you for your word written by the, by the prophet Isaiah some 2,700 years ago that we can apply to our lives today and be blessed. Father, work in our lives. May we turn to you during times of good or in times of crises that we would always look to you. In the name of Yeshua, the Messiah. Amen. As we close in our uh, normal way, we uh, receive the blessing of the Lord upon us. Um, I don't know, I instructed Moshe to pass this blessing on to Aaron, the priest, saying that when you pronounce this over the people, I will bless them and I will put my name upon them. And wherever you are today, uh, wherever you're listening, whatever home you're dwelling in, the Lord offers to put his name upon you, his reputation upon you. Don't carry it lightly. But uh, I would ask you to, uh, to receive this uh, with gratitude and with, uh, with praise as the Lord is not ashamed to call you brother. As it says about Messiah Yeshua, he is not ashamed to call us brothers, uh, but he puts his name upon us. So receive the benediction in the English uh, the, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. 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 Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Look forward to hopefully seeing everybody soon. Blessings. <laughs>